You're at the 2023 Ann Arbor, Michigan Enfield Fest. Right here in the Diag, University of Michigan. My name's The Raven and you're watching GlobalWorldTV.com. I want to say a special thank you to one of our sponsors, www.ProHosting.com. They've been serving The Raven for over 20 years. www.prohosting.com I think they're gonna have a little music start up for us here pretty soon, folks. You're lucky, you're at the 2023 Entheo Fest here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. We're standing right here in the heart of the Diag for you. Hey, I hear some music. Thank you. 
Checking out a little music here at the 2003 Entheo Fest in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. We're GlobalWorldTV.com. You know, we get around every once in a while, folks. I want to say a special hello to all my friends down there in Adrian, Michigan. Hi, y'all. What are you doing down there? You're supposed to be up here at the Entheo Fest. What are you doing sitting around down there in Adrian, Michigan? <laughs> anyway. If I happen to run into you, Bob, if you are up here, come on over and say hi. Haven't seen you for a while. Anyway, we're listening to a little music here at the Antio Fest. They're going to have some speakers come out here pretty soon and talk. And there's a lot of people gathering here at the Diag for Antio Fest 2023. Get up on the 
You're looking at a few of the people at NTO Fest 2023 right here on the Diagon Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Check it out, people. These people look cool. This is my crowd, folks. These are the people I want to hang with. Now this is what it is folks, all these people get together, they all come down here to celebrate the decriminalization of psychedelic organic plant life here in Washington County, Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA, it's county wide, it's decriminalized psychedelics, any kind of organic psychedelics, mushrooms, ayahuasca, you can do it all in Ann Arbor now. And these people are coming together for the second Entheo Fest ever. Last year was the first inaugural event, and now today they're having the second Entheo Fest ever. All these people are here are to celebrate psychedelics, and I love it. The mushrooms, oh yeah. Yeah, I've done a couple myself <laughs> over the years. <laughs> and now you're listening to a little bit of music here on the Diag and celebrating in Theo Fest 2023.
I think about it in three different ways. For so many of us that were impacted, our hearts, our minds, our souls, our lives opened up through these experiences. It became a sacred mission for us. A mission to make sure that the world knew and could benefit from these technologies and these plants. But as all movements grow, there are people who come with different understandings. And so you have those with a mission, and then you have those that are here for commission. Which for some of us, it's distasteful, but it has to be understood that as we grow in complexity, we have to understand that everybody's participation and contribution is important. And so me personally, I had to grow and expand my worldview, where I was very much a purist and very much on the mission, and very much opposed to those who came in commission oriented. But I also understood that those that were commission oriented at least had the understanding that to sustain a movement we need money and we need a responsible way to approach it. And so as we push forward with this movement, as we push forward with legislation, let us remember the very mission and not get caught up in questions of commission or better yet permission. Permission is not something that we ask when we deal with the sacred and the liberation of human consciousness. And commission shouldn't be the reason that we stay in this thing. The overall mission is what cements us all together and let's make sure we stay focused on that mission and make sure that we brave and still our hearts and don't get so used to asking for permission that we end up getting deluded and only pursuing this thing for commission. And so with this, I'm talking about my personal journey to embrace a larger movement for us to try to soothe our anger, our passions toward each other to create a cohesive movement because it is not over. Our cities are being liberated, but our state still needs to be flipped and the language for the state still needs to be defined in a way that reflects the people's will. And in order to do that, we need a people's coalition. We cannot afford it to be put into a traditional bill format where it can be diluted. So let us all steal ourselves for this mission. Let's move around to the tents. Let's find our local organizers, let's get involved, let's get organized so that we can see this thing move forward. And I'm so glad to be here. And I'm soon to take my place as a listener because I'm excited to see the expanding leadership, the expanding voices, the expanding perspectives of what we are, what we will be, and what we become. We are in the movement of human liberation of consciousness. And if you don't know it or not, it's one of the most important movements in history. So celebrate ourselves. Let's celebrate the movement. Let's get to know each other. Yeah. Thank y'all very much. Peace. Murubaki, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> Folks, our, uh, our next speaker uh, has a doctorate in public health here at the University of Michigan. Currently, he's a research assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology working on the appropriate use of cannabis and psychedelics. He's also addressing the harms caused by their criminalization. Is Kevin Banky around here? Kevin? Kevin Banky, yeah. Okay. Hey Q, are you ready? Oh, I know. Sorry, we're moving a little faster today. I apologize. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Kevin Bacon, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, my bad for being late, but um, it's just a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the University of Michigan. And I'm also part of the Michigan Psychedelic Center, um, which is, you know, at this point an institution-wide center where people study anything from the effects of psychedelics to looking 
um, in basic science models, uh, looking at psychedelic music. And uh, what I do in this capacity is looking both at how people use psychedelics and cannabis uh, to treat different health conditions, especially pain, um, and then also um, actually super delighted to note that we uh, are opening our first clinical trial of psilocybin-assisted therapy for fibromyalgia as of this past week. So it's been many years of work in the making, um, and actually I, I just want to express my gratitude to all of you as well because uh, <laughs> the past few years of just waiting to get all of the regulatory approvals in place and all of that work along the way. It's been so heartening to see all of you gather and be like, there is so much that's going on and this work is really important. So thank you all for uh, helping me uh, continue and help, helping the whole team uh, at Michigan continue through that challenging process. So I feel so honored to be able to contribute um, towards a better understanding of how these substances might help with healing. So, uh, in this vein, my deep gratitude to the event organizers, to each of you for your advocacy work. Um, we know how poor outcomes are for so many conventional treatments for things like pain and mental health, and it's incredibly important to learn when and how psychedelics are medically useful. And in addition to that, your work is essential to address the societal pain and suffering caused by the criminalization of these drugs. Um, as we know, uh, decriminalization is the first step towards figuring out how to use these powerful medi medicines thoughtfully and building appropriate societal and interpersonal solutions to help maximize the benefits from their use. Uh, so I don't think there's any one-size-fits-all solution to working with them, so let's figure it out together. We're all here. We're all doing this work anyways. Um, so drawing from the sources represented here from indigenous uh, traditions and wisdom, to science and to our collective lived experience. And so I just want to note as well that over the past two years that this event has been happening, um, you all have shared that collective wisdom uh, with myself, my colleagues, um, and then we've you know, conducted surveys and published on this. At this point, we've actually had over five papers um, come out of the in peer-reviewed scientific journals from the NTOFS surveys, um, and you all have helped us learn a bunch of different things, including most people don't discuss psychedelics with their healthcare providers, um, mostly because of stigma and legal concerns. Uh, we've learned where you all inf obtain information about psychedelics, um, what policies are considered more favorable in the change as we move towards psychedelic liberalization, um, and then you know just basically what the outcomes are of this use. And again, it's been so so helpful. To, to learn all of this from you, and I just encourage you, if you wish to take a survey again, we have another one um, going on uh, this year. We hope to learn all kinds of different things once again, including like what your experiences are with psychedelics, best practices for how to use these most skillfully, including for people who have never used them before, um, and then how psychedelics compare with other substances. So just like we did before, we'll publish these results, we'll share them publicly, um, and thank you all in advance if you choose to participate. So in closing, uh, and psychedelics have just an amazing therapeutic potential and may be a tool that helps us more reconnect more fully both with ourselves and to our living planet. So thank you all for your kind attention. Have a wonderful afternoon. Looking forward to seeing the next speakers. Kevin Banky, everybody. Um, obviously, we're a little ahead of schedule here. He was supposed to speak about a half hour from now. So, um, in, in light of that, I do want to bring up and, and let everyone please put in your prayers right now for Barking Dog uh, Daryl Brown. He's been here the last two years. He was our first keynote speaker. Um, he's just a little under the weather today. Um, we're actually going to be raffling off one of his paintings. He's an award-winning painter um, at our after party today that you can find at Rabbit Hole on First Street, which is on the other side of town. It'll start immediately following this event here today. We're going to have psychedelic DJs, fire spinners. There's going to be all kinds of tables there and things uh, for, for you to enjoy. Um, coming up to our next speaker, everybody. Um, it's so wonderful to be here with you all. Let me find my page. 
Anquanet Sarfo, also known as Q, spent 20 years as a TV journalist and news anchor. Multiple sclerosis cut her career short, and she found plant medicines and went from taking nine pills a day to zero pills a day, which is amazing. I'm down, I'm down to yeah, give it up. And she's been an advocate and visionary for this movement and cannabis movement ever since. Please welcome Q. What's up, everybody? <laughs> Hello, my fellow seekers of healing. Thank you for being here and standing up for the right to choose what plants are best for our bodies. Without you and your bravery to show your face in this fight, people like me would never know we have other options besides expensive treatments and medical regimens that don't work. This year marks 10 years since I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And that diagnosis started my journey into plant-based medicines. Now, I'm a practice what I preach kind of girl, and I really wanted to share my psychedelic experiences with you, but I have tried psilocybin several times and in pretty significant doses, and I'm one of those people who just doesn't feel it. But Julie tells me to keep on trying and maybe take a little bit more, but I'm afraid. I'm, I'm just a little afraid. Still, though, double the dose. Okay, that's what I heard, double the dose. I'll get back to you on that. Still, though, that doesn't mean it's not working or helping me in some manner. In fact, the only study I've found researching MS and psilocybin shows it does help our brains grow new pathways. None of the MS drugs do that. So why is there just one study? And just so you guys know, I was talking to Mr. Uh, Kevin back here, and so he says that maybe MS will be the next one after fibromyalgia, so fingers crossed. But as we all know, psilocybin has been used for centuries by indigenous cultures for its healing properties and its ability to connect us with our inner recesses of our consciousness. It is a substance that, when approached with respect and guidance, has the power to transform lives. Entheogens are showing incredible promise in clinical trials for various mental health conditions from depression to PTSD. Often with just one or two doses that people can grow at home. They have the potential to revolutionize the way we view mental and emotional well-being, offering an alternative to traditional treatments that often fall far, far short. But, dis that's right, <laughs> despite this growing body of evidence supporting the therapeutic benefits of these plants, they remained entangled in legal restrictions and misunderstandings. No plant or fungi is illegal. It is time for change. It is time for us to come together, not just as advocates for entheogens, but as advocates for the rights of individuals to choose their paths of healing and self-discovery. So we must champion, yes, right, we must champion more research, more open-mindedness, more policies that reflect the potential of these incredible substances. We must challenge the stigma and misinformation that surrounds them, replacing fear with understanding and prejudice with compassion. So let us work towards a future where patients like me no longer have to suffer needlessly, where we can access safe and effective treatments that honor the wisdom of nature. Let us make a world where psilocybin and all entheogens are embraced as tools for profound healing and self-discovery, and sometimes even as a recreational escape, because all of us could use an escape from this increasingly crazy world from time to time. So please continue to lead the charge and be the voice of change, advocating for responsible and informed use of entheogens. Together, we will pave the way for a brighter, more compassionate future, one where hope, healing, and transformation are within reach for all. So thank you, and may our collective efforts lead us towards a tomorrow filled with healing and understanding and hopefully by next year Julie will have guided me through my first full psychedelic experience. 
happy Envio Fest, everybody, and keep fighting. Thank you. That's Q, everyone. And Quinette Sarfo. Give it up for her. Thank you, Q, so much for those inspirational words. Q was actually our first MC at the Entheo Fest. Um, I wish you were here today doing the same thing. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, I have a great honor introducing our next speaker. Uh, he's an American poet. He's a writer. He's a musician. He's a political activist. He's really the reason why we're here today. Uh, John Sinclair. You all know who he is. He was arrested uh, right here on this campus for selling a joint and was imprisoned. And that's when Hash Best... Giving away the joint. He wasn't even selling it. <laughs> Giving it away. But he's going to speak right now for us, and uh, we're really happy to have him. Guys, let's give it up. Another big round of applause for John Sinclair. John Sinclair. Check, check. There you go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the U of M Diag. You know, if we would have gathered like this, when we first started taking acid in 1964, 65, 66, they would have arrested every one of us immediately. So we've come a long way. Power to the people. Power, all power. My experience, I was busted three times for marijuana possession. The second time I did six months in the Detroit House of Correction. And the third time I gave two joints to an undercover police woman, and they gave me nine and a half to ten years in prison without any appeal bond. And I say that because two and a half years later, I won my case on appeal, and we threw out the old marijuana laws in 1972. And that began, I'm proud to say I began the Michigan Marijuana legalization movement in 1965. And today we're reaping the benefits of this. You know, I look on the marijuana movement as the last true democratic movement in America, especially in this ugly time of the GOP persecuting us in every possible way. I look on the marijuana movement as the epitome of the democratic process because our elected representatives refused to deal with the issue and kept putting us in prison. And the smokers and the users of marijuana stood up, went to the polls, put out petitions, got people to sign them in the hundreds of thousands, and elected marijuana legalization for ourselves, first for medical reasons in 2008, and then 10 years later, all marijuana possession. You wouldn't know it by the way the government works in Michigan now. You know, this whole thing about legalization, the guy who was in charge of it, they were giving them blow jobs to give them a license. This is the sick kind of shit these motherfuckers are into. Why don't they go to the people who supplied us with marijuana illegally for 80 years, facing, facing arrest, imprisonment, and the worst kind of stuff in the court. Why don't they go to these people and say, what should we do to make this legal and to legalize your sales of marijuana? Why don't you just sell the marijuana, pay a tax on what you sold, and it's just like selling carrots. You know, there's no difference. It's a plant. The thing is, it gets you high. They don't want us to get high. If we get high, we don't want to go to work. <laughs> we don't want to buy a new car. Fuck a new car. We want to get high and fuck and have a good time with each other for no money. <laughs> That's why 
That's why we take LSD and psilocybin to get high and to achieve a state of highness above the everyday life of ugly America that it is today. This is why we got high in the 60s. The beautiful thing was we created a whole new culture in America. They stomped us out by now, but we had an underground press syndicate that had about five million readers. We put out our own news. If we would have had 10 people like Q on television, this would be a different country altogether. If you had 10 people making movies like Michael Moore, this would be a different country altogether. There weren't very many of us, but we got high and we made a big impact and we insisted on our rights to get high and to turn other people on and to try to create a society where people loved each other and took care of each other and fed each other and gave each other medical care if you needed it. That's the society we're talking about. Thank you very much and keep up the good work. Thanks, John. You're the best, man. Come on, guys, one more time. John Sinclair. Wow. So happy you can make it today. Uh, our next speaker, Allison Bond, is obtaining her master's in social work from the University of Michigan right here with a focus on policy, which is going to help all of us in the future. She's also the president of the Students for Sensible Drug Policy, also here at University of Michigan, and a grad instructor at Oakland University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Allison Bond. Always got to adjust the mic because, you know, a little short up here. Um, so how's everybody doing? It's great turnout to be here. Or it's a great turnout today. Lovely weather. Um, but so, you know, I'm, as introduced, I'm Allison from Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Um, and I want to tell you guys about a little story. So a couple weeks ago, I went to a friend's house. And they have what is what I would like to describe as the breaking bad of mushrooms. And it's amazing. You get there and it's like, it's a little surprising. There's these giant tubs and, you know, once you get past all the equipment. And I sat and listened to my friend that has this basically laboratory in his apartment. And, you know, it seems really cool. Like he's, you know, growing in his house. But at the heart of it, is community and harm reduction. And these elements that came from the psychedelic community before it had a label. This was the roots of, these, of this community, bringing people together, having shared experiences, and taking care of each other. As harm reduction and ethnogenic plants and mushrooms become more available to us, and in wonderful places like Ann Arbor and Ferndale, where they've been decriminalized, and give people the opportunity to experience these plants and things that our ancestors have experienced. And we are now able to reconnect with each other in these ancient ways, but in a modern space. And as we make these changes and get back to our roots, no pun intended, um, as we get back to our roots, we should think about how these communities started and the purpose of them and why harm reduction should be at the center of every decriminalization conversation, why, they should be, or why we should be discussing harm reduction in um, public health, and how these, these ideas all intersect. And I ask you, as participants of this beautiful festival, and probably people that enjoy these plants, is think about what they mean and how they serve as harm reduction in both this community and wider substance use communities. 
as the president or former president of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, that's the kind of stuff that we're working on and that we think about. When we work on policy, we want to think about harm reduction and what is going to be the best for our community and getting people into this inclusive space. Thank you. Allison Vaughn, everybody. Thank you. Student leaders are so important. That's the only way we're going to continue with this, is to have that student leadership to keep on passing on the words. Our next speaker, Shinoba, is determined to empower all walks of life to explore the potential benefits of psilocybin. Mushrooms for healing, spiritual enrichment, and so on. He's focused on the greater conclusion of the movement. Please welcome Shinoba. What up, though, everybody? Y'all all right? Y'all all right? I just wanted to share my personal experience with psilocybin. You know, two years ago, I was going through a, a major state of depression and battling uh, prescription drug addiction, prescription opioids. And, um, you know, I was coming across all these different articles about how, you know, psilocybin can... Uh, basically rewire the brain and, and help people, you know, become basically eradicated from depression and drugs addiction and all these different things they were talking about. So it, it started intriguing me. I would stay up nights just studying and reading different articles and on YouTube just trying to understand, like, what these mushrooms was about. And um, actually, two years ago, I was here at Entheofest, you know, and I hadn't even had the experience yet. I had just came here to try to learn and get more information about these mushrooms. And um, my first journey was five grams in silent darkness. It was shortly after Entheofest. I just jumped right in. And uh, it, it completely changed the whole course of my life, you know. I came out of that trip and it was, I couldn't even make myself depressed anymore. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 it was just like I felt reborn some type of way. You know what I'm saying? And um, at a deeper dose, seven grams, it broke the drug addiction to where it, it, it like it disgusted me when I thought about the opioids. Like, damn. Like, I had to take a look at myself. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and that's just... that. That's just the, the first two things. Like it, it has given me so much more that I didn't even ask for out of the out of the sacred medicine. You know, it, it, it has showed me what inner peace is, inner happiness, inner joy, you know, these things that money can't buy. Because I used to I used to stress a lot about money and worrying about this and that. But it's these things that I've tapped into now, there's no amount of money that can buy it. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, that five gram journey has led me here today to share my story with y'all. And I, you know, uh, one thing I want to touch on as well, I see all these clinical trials going on. I see the John Hopkins and all that going on. You know what I'm saying? But I don't see none of my people being included in these trials. I don't see no melanated beans. You know what I'm saying? And that's who I advocate for, you know what I'm saying? I'm tapping in with the hood, the, 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 the forgotten ones, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to see more of our people included in this space, you know what I'm saying? That's why the education is so important, to try to break that fear aspect away from it. Because it's nothing to be afraid of, you know what I'm saying? This medicine has truly changed my life, and I'm going to utilize it for however many years I'm here in this realm, you know? So I thank y'all for giving giving y'all time, and I appreciate y'all. Y'all enjoy the rest of the Entheo Fest. I am Spore Lord Shinoba. Peace. Shinoba, everybody. Thank you for that. Oh, amazing. Guys, uh, just to remind you again, we do have an after party immediately following this amazing event. Uh, it's going to be at Rabbit Hole, which is across... Uh, the, the city here on 1st Street right next to Blind Pig if you know where that is and the Blank Slate which has amazing ice cream um, our next speaker uh, is also somebody that we couldn't have done today without Emma Mead is the president of the Students Association of Psychedelic Studies which is our, 
our logo here in the middle at the bottom. Um, she's a master's school uh, social work student here at U of M. Um, please welcome Emma Mead. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> All right, thank you for that introduction, Jim. Um, Rick Doblin, founder and former executive director of MAPS, once said that the cultural integration of psychedelics won't happen overnight, and the question of young people is perhaps the most difficult involved. The first step is for people who have knowledge of these substances to share it, coming out about their own experiences. Drug education should be honest, and present a balanced picture of risks and benefits. As Jim said, my name's Emma Mead, and I am a social work student here at the University of Michigan, and the president of the Student Association for Psychedelic Studies, also known as SAPS. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I have been interested in the field of psychedelics since the young age of 16, when my silver-haired and ponytailed psychiatric mentor sat me down and raved about the therapeutic benefits being seen in research involving psilocybin, MDMA, and ketamine. Continuing to watch this research unfold, especially here at the University of Michigan, has only deepened my interest in psychedelic therapies. Throughout my late teens and early adulthood, I felt a need to tiptoe around these interests, always worried that I would be labeled a, Bernie, a druggie or a burnout. This experience has motivated me to challenge the stigma around psychedelics, as well as spread awareness and education about their potential benefit. Thus, my involvement with SAPS evolved. So what is SAPS? SAPS is a student-run organization that was founded five years ago by three master's students at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Our, Michigan, our mission has been, and continues to be, to expand objective awareness and provide opportunities for education and discussion about all things psychedelics, including the newest research, therapeutic uses and approaches, legal, excuse me, legal and political developments, ethics, and issues surrounding privilege, oppression, diversity, and social justice. In past years, SAPS has hosted a plethora of community events, including networking dinners, educational talks, and movie screenings. We pride ourselves in being a safe and welcoming platform that brings together diverse communities and groups with the common interest in psychedelics. Last year, SAPS was very excitingly recognized as the official student group of the Michigan Psychedelic Center, otherwise known as MPSYCH. MPSYCH is a university-funded center that represents a breakthrough in making psychedelic research more mainstream, rigorous, and accessible at the University of Michigan. It's been so exciting to see the center open and gives me hope that the next generation of psycho-curious young adults won't have to tip or toe around their interests. MPSYCH has also been a significant funder of SAPS, and we are incredibly thankful for their support. Um, I would also like to extend my thanks to the individual researchers, advocacy groups, and policymakers that have taken on the responsibility of psychoeducation and promotion. Um, without your continued work, we wouldn't be here today, so thank you. Um, thank you as well to Jim and Julie, wherever you are, for allowing me to be a part of creating this beautiful event. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many people interested in this movement. Um, and I appreciate all the work we're all doing here today together. It's important that we continue to take positive strides towards understanding and educating about the risks and benefits of psychedelics, as well as promoting ethical and safe accessibility. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Emma Mead, everybody. We've got some great student leaders. It's amazing. Uh, everybody, you know, what happened after the city of Ann Arbor unanimously passed the resolution to decriminalize plant substances in the city? Another person, our county prosecutor, Ellie Savitt, came out and decriminalized the entire county of Washtenaw. Yes. Please. And, and this gentleman was a law clerk for Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if you're not aware. Um, please welcome Ellie Savitt, everybody.
Well, hello, Antheofest. How am I doing today? Great news is, for the third year in a row, nobody's got to worry about prosecution afterwards. I promise that. And let me tell you this. So when we made the decision not to prosecute the use, possession, or cultivation of entheogenic plants, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, this job that I have requires tough choices. This was not one of them. And the reason for that is, first of all, to give credit to the city of Ann Arbor. The city of Ann Arbor in 2020 made the law enforcement use of resources around entheogenic plants their absolute lowest law enforcement priority. And what we did when we took office was said, this just makes sense. Why on earth would somebody be able to use, cultivate, or grow entheogenic plants in the city of Ann Arbor, but you do it just across the street in Pittsfield Township, or in Ypsilanti, or in Superior Township, and all of a sudden it's criminalized. That doesn't make any sense. Let's expand this county wide. But the other reason this was an easy decision is because of what entheogenic plants, because of what naturally occurring psychedelics actually are. I've had the opportunity, since we issued our policy, to hear from folks who had experienced significant trauma in their past, military veterans, victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, spousal abuse, who told me that using entheogens was what got their mind right, that it was medicine that helped them grow and helped them get back, uh, get, get better. And I've also know that many people use it for spiritual purposes. And the truth of the matter is there are many people, there are scientists, there are folks that are spiritual leaders, there are people that have lived experience dealing with their trauma using naturally occurring psychedelics that can talk about that far better than I. But those are the benefits, right? What are the costs? Well, let's talk about this. Naturally occurring psychedelics are non-addictive. They are not associated with increases in violence. In fact, if you read the research, they are associated with reduced intimate partner violence in men who use them. So when we're thinking about the real and potentially life-saving therapeutic benefits that entheogenic plants have on the one hand and the non-existent costs on the other hand, why on earth would we be criminalizing? Why on earth would we be prosecuting? So we said we're not, we haven't, and we won't. But I want to talk about the inequities that remain. I mentioned that it made no sense to have entheogenic plants functionally decriminalized in the city of Ann Arbor, but not in Ypsilanti, and not in Pittsfield Township, and not in Superior Township. But right now, we have that same inequity across our state and across our country. Because in Washtenaw County, you don't have to fear prosecution for the use, possession, or cultivation of entheogenic plants. But if you cross the border into Livingston County, into Wayne County, you do, unless you're in the city of Detroit, which thankfully a couple years ago decriminalized them themselves. And the truth of the matter is, this is a movement and we should not stop until we have sensible policy, not just across the state, but across the United States of America. And over the past several years, thanks to folks advocating, thanks to folks sharing their personal stories, thanks to the fact that it is working, we have seen more and more jurisdictions make the logical and sensible choice to not treat medicine, not treat naturally occurring psychedelics as though they are a criminal matter. We've seen it in several cities here in Michigan. We've seen it in Denver. We've seen it in California. We've seen it in places in Massachusetts. I know there's a bill that uh, Senator Irwin has been working on to decriminalize it statewide in Michigan. 
And I know that there is a bill sitting on California Governor Gavin Newsom's desk that has been passed by the legislature that would make our biggest state a haven for decriminalization. That is due to this movement. The progress that has been made, and we saw it with cannabis, and we're seeing it with entheogens, the progress that is made because, because people are standing up, people are sharing their stories, people are advocating, people are talking to their legislators and law enforcement leaders and prosecutors. We should welcome that. I want to say that I will be standing with you in this movement every step of the way, alongside you, not on opposite sides of the courtroom. Let's keep this movement going. Let's not stop until we have sensible drug policy across the United States of America. Thank you. Ellie Savin, oh my gosh. Give it up for Ellie. Thank you so much, our county prosecutor. Uh, if I ever reminded you and you're just showing up, we have an after party. It's starting completely after this event. Uh, it's on First Street at a place called Rabbit Hole. Everybody, our next speaker, Dr. Megan Oxley, is a board-certified emergency medicine physician. She's a Wayne State graduate, and she was fellowship trained in integrative psychiatry. Dr. Megan Oxley is also the founder and medical director of an integrative ketamine clinic called Michigan Progressive Health. Please give it up for Dr. Megan Oxley. Um, I want to say thank you to the organizers of Theofest for asking me to come and speak today. It was really an honor. Um, I am the medical director for an integrative psych psychiatry and psychedelic clinic uh, where we use ketamine to help people with their mental health in chronic pain conditions. Uh, I'm really also honored to be doing that work on a daily basis. We've been there for seven, over seven years now. Um, I struggled a bit with what to talk about today. There are certainly so many stories of people getting better with entheogens and plant medicines that have come out of the work that I've done with patients. We could focus on that, but I feel like that's what every story is about, like how helpful they are. Um, I could talk about how mushrooms have helped me be a better human and helped me be a better mom, and that could be my story too. But I really wanted to bring a story that I feel like isn't being talked about a lot. I, I don't hear it enough. It was news to me. So I'm going to share my story and my growth and understanding about these medicines um, and how helpful they are. So I grew up in the 80s, and I was totally a child of the D.A.R.E. era. Um, I'm a doctor, so like I was a really good student, right? And so I like just fed all the lies that they told us about um, medicines and drugs. I thought like if I did LSD, I would burn my eyes out by staring at the sun. If I did psilocybin, I'd freaking jump out a window, right? And I was just like, oh, yeah, that must be totally true, because I'm at school, and they're teaching me this, right? Um, in particular, my favorite um, childhood m memory is the, the D.A.R.E. commercial where the kid, the dad walks in on the kid doing drugs, and the dad's like, where'd you learn how to do that? And the kid says, I learned it from watching you, Dad. If you were around in the 80s and 90s, you've definitely seen that commercial. So even as a grown adult, I listened to this History Channel show on LSD. They talked about how your neurons would fire backwards and forwards, and you'd have these amazing experiences. And I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. And my husband, who was also a dear kid, was like, that's crazy. I'm not babysitting you while they, you, you do that. So fast forward a decade. Now I'm giving people ketamine on a daily basis. I'm helping their mental health. We're seeing amazing results. And I'm starting to understand that mental health issues are not just about biological factors, but also rooted in trauma and a fractured society. I'm starting to read books like Orange is the New Black by Piper Kerman, A Really Good Day by Islet Waldman, or Chasing the Scream by Johan Hari. I finally got the facts on Just Say No. I was totally floored. Maybe you know the punchline already, but I sure as hell didn't. The war on drugs isn't because they're bad and they're harming people, but it's because our country was and continues to be racist. Yeah. And that's just not what I was taught. 
clearly I already told you what I was taught. And I imagine that there's a whole slew of people out there watching this movement, having learned the things that I've learned, never taking the time to look at it again, or the experiences haven't put them in the direction to learn this stuff. And that's what I'm really hoping to share that message. I'm hoping that we can achieve through decriminalization and wide acceptance of psychedelics is not an understanding, not only a new understanding of ways to treat mental health that aren't just take a pill and call me in the morning, but rather a broad dismantling of systemic racism in our country. So that's the dream. And that's the reason I'm sharing this story. There are, there are many amazing organizations that are working on this. Shakruna is my favorite. All of the books I mentioned could be helpful if you want to learn more, as well as the Michael Pollan book that's everywhere. Thanks for your time. Dr. Megan Oxley, everybody. Give it up. Doing great work uh, at our two places here in the state. Our next speaker, Yusuf Rabi, was a House of Representative member for the 53rd District, and then he became the Washtenaw County Commissioner. More recently, he went to work demanding more responsibility from DTE to secure us a better power grid. Thank you for that. Please welcome Yusuf Rabi. Antiope 2023! How are we doing today? It is so amazing to see all of you out here today. I thought it was going to be cloudy, maybe a little rainy, but it's sunny. It's beautiful. The earth, the universe is smiling upon us because what we are doing today is fighting for her. We are here to fight for the plants. We are here to fight for the fungi. We are here to fight for the earth. At the end of the day, what this is about for me, this is a classic example of corporate America, of the pharmaceutical industry, that does not want you to believe that the earth will heal you. They do not want you to believe that your medicine can come from the ground. They want you to go to Walgreens. They want you to go to CVS. They want you to get drugged up on their pills. They want you to pay out of your pockets to fuel their profits. From your pockets to their profits. That's what this is about. And so what we are doing here today is raising awareness that what grows in the earth is not poison. It is medicine. It is medicine. It has been medicine not for decades. It has been medicine not for centuries. It has been medicine since the beginning of humanity. It has been cultivated. It has been grown. And it has been shown to work, to help people, to grow our humanity, to grow our connection to nature, to grow our connection to one another. We are human. We are part of this planet. We will not give up in this struggle for the liberation of our planet, for the liberation of our plants, for the liberation of our fungi. We will not bend to corporate power. We will not bend to corporate greed. We will not bend to the pharmaceutical industry and to politicians that stand with them, not with the people. We are here. We are strong. We will rise. We will win. It is for all of us. It is for the planet. Let's go do this. Power to the people. Power to the planet. Power to the plants. Thank you. Wow. I can still feel it up here. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got so many great leaders in this movement. Our next person, Cornelius Williams, is a leader in peer education and harm reduction. Cornelius is also a member of Dance Safe, which is one of our community tents here today over here on the side. And he's on the board of Decriminalization Michigan. Please give it up for Corn.
All right, what's up, Entheo Fest? That was a lot of energy. Uh, a lot of energy, yes, yes. And I think we're all, we're all with it here, right? We're all anti-consumerists. We're all borderline anti-capitalists like this fine gentleman said before me. Um, what I came to talk to you guys about a little bit is, is harm reduction and how antiogens and psychedelics fit into harm reduction. Um, we still have a lot of people dying in the state of Michigan because there's no access to reasonable alternatives. And I'm not here just to point out problems, but I do want to say that over 5,000 people died in this state last year from overdose, cirrhosis, and suicide. We know that these plant medicines are a, a path and a gateway to heal our minds and to evolve our consciousness as humans. The data shows that they reduce problematic substance use. The data shows that they help save lives. And so harm reduction is a part of this entheogenic movement. So the people who have been on here before have been discussing that this is a renaissance. They call it a psychedelic renaissance, which is the rebirth of a psychedelic movement. I personally didn't know that it ever died. <laughs> And so in the, in the spirit of those who have been telling us to turn on, tune in, and drop out for decades now, let's start to lean on our legislators. Let's start to hold them to what they're saying when they come up here and they speak to us and they tell us that they support our cognitive liberty, that they support our freedom to use plant medicines, that they support our freedom to connect with each other and be a community. Let's make it more than words. Let's make it real. And we can do that through cooperation and not competition, right? That's the anti-corporate greed. That's the anti-capitalist sentiment. We are here together for a reason. Let's make it happen. Much love, guys. Cornelius Williams, everybody. So um, why couldn't the mushroom get into the club? Anybody know this one? He wasn't mold enough. So. All right. He's trying to break it a little bit. Everybody, um, it is a, a great honor to bring up our next speaker. Um, he's been with us for over a decade fighting for cannabis law. Uh, he's been our champion in the House of Representatives as a Washtenaw County Commissioner. He served a decade as a Washtenaw County Commissioner and six years as a House of Representative member. And today, Senator Jeff Irwin still fights for our environment, education, and health. Uh, he's our champion of the Senate, like I said, for more reasons than that, but for helping us today as well. Thank you. Please welcome Senator Jeff Irwin. Oh my gosh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Entheofest. It's so great to be here. It's so great to see so many of you here gathered on the Diag to speak out for freedom. Uh, I'm just so happy to be invited again to speak at Entheofest. So thank you to the organizers who put all this together and gave us this beautiful opportunity on this beautiful day to talk about our important freedoms here in Michigan and here in these United States, the freedom to use plant medicine, the freedom to use these plants in rituals, it's incredibly important. So I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored to have sponsored Senate Bill 499 here in Michigan, which would decriminalize entheogenic substances for all the people of Michigan. Now, you know this because you're here, but entheogenic substances have a long history serving human beings. They have a long history of use for thousands of years as religious and cultural uh, 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 substances of significance. Uh, they have uh, long been used as medicine, and they have been showing great efficacy in medical trials across the world, medical trials that should be happening here at this university. And they have a low propensity for abuse. Yeah, thank you, sir. They have a low propensity for abuse. And so that's why a couple years ago, I stepped out and introduced legislation to say, nobody should go to jail 
for using these antheogenic substances. Nobody should go to jail for using substances that have a long history of religious and cultural significance, that have real promise to treat depression, anxiety, PTSD, a wide range of important ailments that affect the lives of millions of people. Absolutely. And these substances aren't very dangerous. When you look at their actual physiological effects, these are not dangerous substances. So why is it that they're strictly illegal? Why is it that, that we write laws to throw people in jail? Right? Is it ignorance? Is it big pharma? Is it all these things? It's all these things. And that's why here in America, I'm asking you to get active to support Senate Bill 499. I'm asking you to stand up for the values that would really make this place the land of the free and the home of the brave, right? There's so many ways that we do not live up to our greatest ideals. And I'm asking you to be brave by reaching out to your state representative, reaching out to your state senator, and asking them one simple question. Do you think we should still prohibit people from using these substances? Do you think we should still send people to jail for using these substances? Because there's only one right answer. And I can tell you this, if enough of us are brave and if enough of us step out and start asking those questions of our public officials, start asking them, if you believe people should go to jail for using entheogenic substances, why? Show up at their town halls. Show up at their community meetings where they're having coffee and talking about important issues. And ask about this important issue. Because the answers to these questions are obvious. And the only reason we do not have freedom and justice with entheogenic substances is because these politicians and elected leaders are able to run from answering that question. They're able to hide and not answer that question. So I'm asking you to be brave. I'm asking you to build those relationships. I'm asking you to, if necessary, get in their face and make them answer. Send emails, make phone calls, show up at their events and ask them, should people go to jail for using entheogenic substances? Should people go to jail for using them in ritual or ceremony? Should people be prevented from using them to treat their mental illness? Should the University of Michigan be prevented from developing new cutting-edge treatments to make human lives better? The obvious answer is no. And the obvious answer is that they should support Senate Bill 499. And so I'm asking for your support. Please get involved to support this issue politically. Get involved in your communities. Keep asking the question, can we have freedom for people to use these important substances that will make their lives better? Thank you again, Anthea Fest. Thank you all for being here. And thank you for getting active on behalf of justice and freedom. Senator Jeff Irwin, everybody. So it's a great pleasure to bring up our next speaker. Um, she's a real leader. She's a former member of the Students for Sensible Drug Policy. She's a former deputy sheriff. And she's a social worker. And now she's running for sheriff in Washtenaw County. Please give it up for Alicia Dreyer. Uh, it's dire, not drier, but it's, <laughs> it's been happening a while. Hey, everybody. All right, so my name is Alicia Dyer. I'm running for sheriff in Washtenaw County. And so I'm going to talk from a law enforcement perspective about natural occurring psychedelics. When I was working in law enforcement, we were being forced to go on raids for cannabis in our community before it was legalized. And doing this work on the street level, I saw how communities were being devastated. I grew up in Ypsilanti and saw many friends and family being harmed by the war on drugs in our community. Seeing all this harm led me to go back to school and get a degree in social work and public policy and start community organizing to stop the war on drugs because I believe that the war on drugs is the war on people in our communities. And as a social worker that's working as a therapist now, we can't ignore 
what natural occurring psychedelics and psych psychedelics are doing to treat PTSD. There have been law enforcement officers that have killed themselves because of PTSD that could have actually had treatment if we stop politicizing the war on drugs and actually start legalizing naturally occurring psychedelics. And so when you think about the harm that the war on drugs is causing and you think about how the first responders in our community are used as pawns to go out and enforce these archaic drug laws that are actually helping promote public safety, then we have to think differently. So I am running for sheriff to fight to stop the war on drugs. I am will, I'm going to be supporting our local prosecutor who has decriminalized natural occurring psychedelics in Washtenaw County. And I'm going to stand with you all and fight hard to make this happen at the state level because it is absolute bullshit that we are here in 2023 and we're still doing this. So thank you. Woo! Alicia Dyer, ladies and gentlemen. D-Y-E-R when you see that on the ballot. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a good friend of mine, or is one of our next speakers, Shan Vicious is on the board of decriminalization nature, Hazel Park. She helped decriminalize Hazel Park. And she uses her own experiences to educate others on plant and fungi medicines. Please welcome Shan, everybody. Thanks, Jim. So my name is Shan Vicious. I'm the founder of Decrim Nature Hazel Park. I've spent the last six years of my life educating and advocating for entheogens and plant medicines, pretty much in and around the city of Detroit and throughout Michigan. I'm really honored and grateful to be asked to speak here for the third year. It's such a privilege to watch the movement grow from being in a clubhouse to having the support of everybody here today. We've decriminalized four major cities within this time frame, and I'm really grateful and proud of our citizens and the legislators who have supported us. That means our messages are working. We are successfully getting the truth out and promoting body autonomy. Okay. Now, I'm gonna make this really short. We've heard hundreds of stories about the power of these healing plants and fungi. Most of us in this space we already know somebody who's benefited from the use of entheogenic plants and fungi. From moms suffering from postpartums, to veterans coming back from war, to senior age citizens. We already have the scientific data to back up our self-guided experiments, thanks to organizations like MAPS and John Hopkins. So what this means now is that we need to focus and to continue to destigmatize the use of the medicine within our community. Lots of marginalized communities do not have access to health care or resources. Therefore, we have to create them. Psilocybin has been proven to enhance the feeling of interconnectedness. So we must show each other how to meditate, how to cultivate, and how to integrate this medicine. It's up to us as a community to help heal each other. We must continue to provide education and safe use and safe destigmatized de community spaces for true healing. Being in community is especially important during times of stress and uncertainty. Knowing that we are not alone in our struggles can provide a sense of comfort, relief, and support. In order for these plants to work, we must continue healing in all aspects of ourselves, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and most important, socially. We may have suffered from PTSD, anxiety, or depression as individuals, but if we can come together in community by creating spaces we're using the correct tools and the correct methods, we can heal together in community. So continue to write your city council members, keep calling your state representatives, make sure you're donating to Decrim Nature and our statewide initiative. Thank you so much. That was Shan, everybody. Everybody, um, hey Chuck, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm on. Let's go. The next speaker spent 33 years as a kindergarten teacher, 20 years as a township trustee, and is a licensed professional counselor. He organized many cannabis ballot initiatives, beginning with the medical cannabis uh, for Ann Arbor here. He's also one of the people responsible for back in the 70s when there was a $5 fine for possession. Uh, he started MI Legalized, which helped 
legalize the state of Michigan. He's a leader, uh, as you can tell, and all he does is win, win, win no matter what. Chuck Ream, everybody. Really wonderful to see everybody here today. And I am uh, getting older now and use these substances for 70, I mean, for 57 years. I seem to still be all right. And this is going to go on after I'm not here. I will not be here soon enough. And I know that you will continue this struggle on and on until we can improve our civilization, improve our culture, make people more happy. Welcome to the wonderful city of Ann Arbor, a city not afraid to be a leader in psychedelic and cannabis policy reform. The legalization of cannabis did not start in Colorado or California. It started right here in 1972 when the Human Rights Party got the city council to vote in the $5 fine. That's legalization. And my button says... Five dollars is fine with me, right there. We have a great mayor, city council, and county prosecutor. Ann Arbor will continue to lead as we move forward to fully normalize and integrate cannabis and psychedelics into American culture. Ann Arbor will always be the leader, and I've got another great idea coming up for them. We're here today to celebrate the magic and usefulness of psychedelic plants. When my generation discovered psychedelics in the 1960s, we thought that we had something brand new. But no, these plants of illumination have been around forever, providing guidance and healing for humans. We have now separated ourselves from the teachings of the plant and fungal worlds at our great peril. We are destroying our Mother Earth. Psychedelics have got to be available to therapists, but they cannot help transform our culture unless they are freely available to everyone. And theogens have to be legal for regular people, for community rituals, for churches, initiations, ecstatic joy, healing, and for the individual investigation of consciousness. Drug use... Drug use is going to skyrocket on this earth when civilization begins to crumble as the planet warms up. To enrich our culture and maybe help humans survive, we must throw our moral weight behind drugs that are transformative and less harmful. Cannabis and psychedelics can be extraordinarily powerful, as you know, but also very safe there are hundreds of cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, and psychedelics. People in the future should be able to construct a safe drug for themselves that puts them exactly where they want to be without addiction or disease or, or social problems. Alcohol, most of my family is dead from alcohol. Alcohol and white powders can produce a great high for a while and then destroy your life. In terms of safety and transformative potential, cannabis and the psychedelics are exceptional. Safety is important to me, and we should always advocate, we should always emphasize the exceptional safety of what we advocate. And it's not racist to say that safer drugs are safer and usually better for people. In Michigan, we're proud that many of our greatest authentic psychedelic leaders are black people. May the soul of the epic Detroit psychedelic leader, Kilindi, rest in peace. He was great. I got to meet him one time. Then he died of COVID. It was an absolute tragedy. Psychedelics must be for everyone. And it's not enough to just beg for our rights or even do research. This is the land of the free. It's outrageous that sacred healing plants could ever be illegal. We have a natural right to anything that grows out of the ground. We should do research and talk to lawmakers, but that is just the beginning. 
The voters are with us now. The voters are with us now. So we hold the power, don't we? We hold the ultimate power. We can make them do what we want. Sometimes we must take direct political action like they did in Detroit with their vote to legalize psychedelics. Yes, we will need political work. We will need to win at the ballot box, just like with cannabis. My friend Tim Beck and I put together 24 citywide victories in Michigan for cannabis over a period of 15 years. We worked hard. If you make victory seem inevitable at the city level, it will happen at the higher levels. Now we have fought so long and so hard for our holy substances. Suddenly now the wind is at our back and our sails are full. Change will happen quickly now, but we must be very careful to thoroughly study and to influence any new changes in law. We want freedom. Other people might want money and power. We want freedom for individuals. I know that you all will stay strong and never give up. We represent the light and the hope. My love to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck Ream, everybody. Amazing guy. Yeah, Chuck. Is Mike Williams out there? I know he's probably by the dance safe tents. Mike, are you on your way up? There he is. Mike Williams, co-founder of Decriminalization uh, Nature Michigan in Ann Arbor. Mike was also on the board for Student Sensible Drug Policy, uh, Michigan Initiative for Community Healing, and he's the president of Dance Safe and a provider of sustainable harm reduction services. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Williams. How's it going, NDL Fest? It's good to see everybody. Um, Psychedelic therapeuticalization is here. The movement has its feet, its wings, it's taken off. But a very heavily regulated model is coming federally for therapeuticalization faster than we're going to see cannabis legalization. And what I mean by that is when psychedelics get legal, we're going to see a very pharmaceutical dominated industry. Unless we continue doing this, we need to continue doing this, not just Cynthia Fest. This next Wednesday, Magic Mushroom Day, at the Capitol, we will be there at the Capitol, calling out to our Congress people, enough is enough. In the state of Michigan, we have a unique chance right now to protect plant-based entheogens and the right of every human being in this state to cognitive liberty, bodily autonomy, and the right to connect with nature. That's what this is about. These plants are the fruits of the earth, as are we, and these are for us. And no man's law will ever supersede nature's law. So continue gathering like this. Continue talking to your friends. And if you're diving outside of the plant-based substance world, stop over to the Yale Dance Safe tent and we'll talk about harm reduction. I love you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being so amazing. Let's keep doing this. We'll only do it together. I love you. Michael File Williams, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Okay, we're, we're on our last stretch here, and if I haven't mentioned it, there is an after party. It's immediately following here across town at First Street at Rabbit Hole. Check it out, folks. Um, here we go. We're going into uh, one of my favorite people that started out as a, um, as a county commissioner here in Washtenaw County. State Rep. Jason Morgan earned a Master's of Public Administration degree from the Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. He's an elected state representative now and has been an advocate for plant medicines and fungi since those days as a commissioner. Please welcome State Rep. Jason Morgan. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I am, uh, I've just heard that I'm the only thing between you and an after party, so I will be brief. Uh, 
My name is Jason Morgan, and I am so proud to have you here in the 23rd District in the State House. I represent Ann Arbor, as well as parts of Wayne and Oakland counties. Uh, and I just want to say uh, congratulations and thank you for celebrating this third anniversary of decriminalizing ethiogens here in Ann Arbor. As was mentioned, here in Washtenaw County, we have a long history of standing up for what is right long before anyone else is even thinking about it or considering it. One of the first things I did when I met with, uh, when I was elected, uh, was having a meeting with great folks who are here to talk about this, this important issue and to understand what we can do at the state level to make sure that we have access to this very basic right uh, to enjoy things and to be, uh, to face medical uh, benefits of things that come from the earth. Through the act of being here today, you are standing up for these basic rights in the same way that folks stood up for decriminalization of marijuana. You are standing up for, for shifting resources from things that put people behind bars and criminalize basic human behavior to a place where we can celebrate and provide more freedom and frankly spend money in way, more, way better ways, way more important ways. This movement that you are here to do, this movement is about shifting treater, uh, from treating users as criminals to informed, a caring approach as human beings who are just exercising our basic freedoms. And let me say this, I feel hopeful that we can have change in Lansing. I know my colleague Yusuf Rabi, who's a good friend of mine, talked about the many reasons why folks might stand up against what we're trying to do here today. Folks who stand to benefit financially or from some other mechanism rather than allowing us these freedoms. And so I'll, I will simply say this, I am very proud to stand with you, to be with you, uh, and to continue this fight. So thank you so much for being here, standing up, making your voice heard, and allowing me to be part of it. Thanks so much. State Rep. Jason Morgan, everybody. Thank you so much. So we've got many cities in the state of Michigan that have decriminalized. If there's a city where you're at right now and you want to start this process, please reach out to the people here. Uh, you can get that process going by starting at your city council. Uh, one of those people that did that is the next speaker. Kelsey Taylor helped decriminalize Ferndale. Uh, with some folks there. Uh, she has a master's in public health. Please welcome Kelsey Taylor. breath together if we haven't yet just an intentional breath being here breathing in all of the intention and passion from the speakers and this space and this collective mission here and that is really um, what I'd like to address today is our intention with these medicines uh, there's a lot of research and a lot of the why it should be be done and why should we we should have access I want to speak just briefly to the how as these changes start to being made and the medicines become more accessible how we can approach it with intention and reverence and really get the most benefit out of this uh, medicine it's important first of all to recognize that there is no panacea there is not one thing that will cure all things. It's really another tool, so we can use other tools, including our intention and our connection with our community that will help us heal. We don't do anything when we heal alone, and these medicines are meant to be used in sacred spaces and with the support of our communities and we have that here. Just look around, all the people that are passionate about this, all the people that have healed with this medicine and have a relationship with it. 
So I encourage you, if you are new to this, if you're interested in these medicines, to get curious and get some clarity on that why and seek out other people that have benefited for what you're looking for and how you can work together and with the support of your tribe and your community in working with these medicines. So please keep that in mind with your intention and your approach to the medicine and just know that these are gifts from nature. They are benevolent. They are there to help us guide us back to our, our true and authentic selves. So please find that place within you and uh, blessings on all of your journeys. Thank you. Kelsey Taylor, everybody. Well, I'm getting old here. Okay. Everybody, I, I want to take some time and thank a few people that are responsible for today's events. I want to thank Chris Kurtz, who designed our website at entheofest.org. You can go there to find all kinds of information about next year's and the stuff we've done here today. I want to thank Latricia Matson, who's over here at the Weedsters booth on the side, for our beautiful brochure. She did such an amazing job. Our pre-party by Unity Vibrations in Ypsilanti, also spearheaded by uh, Thea Green. So thank you, Thea, for all that help. Our after party, Mars Her Mar uh, Moss Herberholtz, who was supposed to be uh, speaking here, but we seem to have lost him. And Zach, is he here? Wonderful. We're going to bring him up here to say a couple words. He was uh, part of the very first Cynthia Fest here. Um, I want to thank our after, our, uh, after party venue, the Rabbit Hole. And then, of course, our digs here. I want to thank the University of Michigan for everything that they've done uh, for us to be here today. Uh, folks, let me bring up uh, the SAPS president back three years ago when we first did our inaugural Entheo Fest. Uh, he's now working in therapies himself in different modalities. Please welcome Mar Moss Herbeholtz. Hello everyone, so grateful to be here with you all. Um, as we continue to celebrate what we have accomplished as a community, I want us to continue to be able to, um, so we're here to celebrate, right? And we're also here to think forward into the future and how we might be envisioning what might come next for us. Um, I'm reminded of a song by Bacha Levine uh, that goes like this. Another world's not only possible, on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. I want to live in a world in which we recognize the harms that have resulted from the racist war on drugs. And I appreciate the speakers that have come before me that have mentioned this, including Dr. Oxley and, and Korn. May we live in a world in which we recognize that the racist war on drugs makes the world more dangerous for all people, those who use drugs and those who do not. I want to live in a world in which we recognize that the racist war on drugs makes drugs and drug use more dangerous for all people who use drugs. I want to live in a world in which we take action towards preventing overdose deaths, which, by the way, are 100%, 100% reversible if naloxone is administered on time, by providing life-saving harm reduction resources to those who need them. I want to live in a world in which we reject both considering addiction through a moralistic and also through a medicalized model. Rather than demonizing or judging the use of drugs, I hope we can celebrate human capacity to adapt in the face of trauma by utilizing the tools we have at our disposal in order to cope. I want to live in a world in which we work to reverse the harms of the racist war on drugs and provide reparations to those affected by the oppressive systems that have been place, in place in our country since its founding. So as we reflect on and celebrate what we have accomplished today, may it embolden us in our continued efforts to make the world a safer, more compassionate, and more joyful place for all. Another world's not only possible. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. 
I look forward to continuing to build that world with you all. Thank you. Moss Herberholtz, everybody. Well, we are on to our keynote speaker. Uh, this is so exciting. We're grateful to have Reverend Mariana Perez Simmons. She was born and raised in Cuba, studied at Duke University in Benin College. She's a community minister of Afro-Caribbean ancestry. Her life and work are dedicated as a spiritual teacher to return in humanity to its original goodness and divine essence. She's an artist and creates in different mediums with the intention to, and this is how she says it, is to facilitate the journey inward for herself and for others. Please welcome Reverend Mariela Perez Simmons. Thank you, Mariela. I'm waiting for the music because I said, if there is no dance, I don't want to be part of this revolution. Who said that? No, it was Emma Goldman, I believe. Anyways, I'm waiting for the music. But you know, while I wait for the music, I want a selfie with you all. Such a great crowd. Love the mandalas there. So I just couldn't. It gets the energy going. I say that a key to a movement is movement. So much about this work is about our bodies and how our body autonomy has been taken away from us. So I go by Rev Mariela, and it's because, because I come with reverence. I come with reverence, I come with passion, I come with abundance, I come with spirit, I come with creativity. First and foremost, I come with reverence for life. I come with reverence for this ancient sacred music that we have listened to today. These are lineages, lineages. generations of music that has been transferred through some of our musicians today. So I come with reverence for the music. I come with reverence for the earth underneath us. I come with reverence for the original ancestors of this land and for the indigenous people that who still continue to live on these lands. I come with reverence for the organizers of this event whom I have watched for months and months and months give of their time and, and the energy to bring us all here to celebrate, to celebrate. I love celebration. So with deep reverence for the uh, organizers of the events and the volunteers. And above all, I come with reverence for our sacred plants and fungi who have done so much for us, so, so much for us. I come with reverence for the plants and the lineage holders of these plants. I mean, without them, they were persecuted. They had to hide to protect this wisdom, this knowledge, we wouldn't know what kind of mushroom to eat. We wouldn't know how to prepare them. They were put through so much because of their love and their knowledge and their wisdom. And, co and so we must have reverence for the lineage holders of these medicines, of these sacraments. 
of these liberating plants and fungi because so much of this is about liberation. I come with reverence for my own ancestors, some of them Taino Arawak people of the Caribbean, some of them Yoruba people of West Africa, some of them from southern Spain. I come with reverence for your ancestors and for the journeys that brought each of you here. I also come with passion. I come with tremendous passion. A passion for these plants and fungi. Passion is something I inherited from my ancestors. Passion is fire. And I'm going to tell you why I'm passionate about entheogens. This right here, I carry with me all over because this is the autonomic nervous system ladder. This is the way I see it. Down here, you have the free state. This is freeze and panic and you're so afraid and you hide under freeze. A little higher than that is fight or flight. Down here is hypoarousal. Up here is now hyperarousal. You gotta do something. You gotta do something. It's this anxiety does that. And the more you move up the autonomic nervous system ladder, we have states of like courage. Courage is a little more energetic than shame and fear. Courage allows you to stand up, to rise. Then there is creativity. And the list goes on. I mean, we have peace and ease and grace and ecstasy and divine love. You see the feathers up there, angel wings. The way I see it, down there is hell and up there is heaven. And I know because I have been to both. And I know because my ancestors have been to both. I know this in my bones. And so I came here to this work because I was in hell. Because I found myself down there and I couldn't get up. I mean, always, I'm Cuban. I'm Cuban. I grew up dancing. Like joy and creativity were my thing. I would have a bad day. The next morning I would wake up and my joy would be there. My creativity would be there. And then days and weeks and months and years and what the F? This is inhumane. And people live down there? And people live in hell? And so I was introduced to the mushrooms and I came to them for selfish reason. I mean, it's not selfish to want to heal yourself, but what these medicines give us, right? So I came because of healing and what I found was the universe. What I found was magic. What I found was enchantment. What I found was spirit. What I found was hope. What I found was faith. What I found was something so much larger to believe in. What I found was the desire to live. When I was depressed down there, when I couldn't get up of bed to make breakfast for my child, I mean, like, I had so much energy. People used to say, you could lit up a football stadium. And I'm like, probably, let's try it. How do you go from having so much energy to not being able to get out of bed in the morning? Systems of oppression. Racism. Institutional racism. Oppression. But, so... So then I started making it to heaven. Oh my God! I started making it to these places of bliss and ease and peace and it was so beautiful. And some people get up there and they're like, this is nice, this is so nice, this is so lovely. And I would get angry. This is possible? I mean, like, that we can live up here? But it, the medicine took me there, but then I started getting there by myself, right? I didn't need anything. I mean, I took a quarter of a, of a psilocybin mushroom the other day and like, like, I mean, like tiny. I mean, like I'm telling you, a dime size, not a quarter, dime size. Whoa, like 
I feel like it breaks ceiling after ceiling after ceiling, and it allows you to do this, which I call the rise of the fallen ones. The rise of the fallen ones. So, so I'm angry, and I'm like, who took this away from us? How dare they? And I tell you who? The colonizers. There was a time when people all over the world lived close to the land. The land provided everything they needed. Medicine, food, water, spirituality, everything. Sacred plants and fungi. Pretty much, they grow pretty much all over the world. But then one day, the cold-blooded, the cold-hearted barbarians came. One day, the brutes came and they took everything from them. And I'm not just talking about my ancestors. I'm talking about all your ancestors from Europe too. Land-based people who knew how to live in harmony with nature, who had never known that kind of brutality that throws the nervous system down the autonomic nervous system ladder, down into hell, down into trauma. They took their land, their wisdom, their language, everything. And they went all over the world, land by land, people by people, spirituality by spirituality. By the time the brutes, the cold-hearted barbarians arrived in my island, in Cuba, in the Caribbean, in 1492, my ancestors, the Taino Arawak people, lived there in peace, in matrilineal societies. Women could be high shifters back then. Let me tell you, in 500 years, there has not been a, a high priestess in Cuba or here. Right? A matrilineal society, yet they were called brutes, savages. Women could be high shifters. Women had autonomy over their bodies. They lived in paradise, and I don't mean to, roman I mean, to romanticize my, my ancestors. I mean, come on, it's the Caribbean. Powder, sugar, sand, clear waters, good weather year-round. You can grow food year-round. You don't have large animals that can, you know, like we invented the hammocks because you can actually lay on a hammock because you're not afraid of something that's going to come get you. The hammocks were created by my ancestors. So Taino meant the good people. And they were because the land had turned them into good people. Columbus wrote to the queen, In all my travels, I have never been people, I have never met people who are this kind. They would make great servants, he said. The motherfucker. I don't, I really, they were innocent, good, kind of people. They didn't know what evil was. They had no way to defend themselves against that kind of evil. The land had turned my ancestors into good, kind people. And I don't know if you know this, but the name Cubensis from the psilocybin Cubensis come from Cuba. They were discovering Cuba, which means that my ancestors and I could have encountered them and built a relationship with them. But yeah, that was taken away from us too. So then they went to West Africa, where my Yoruba ancestors lived and where they practiced their culture and their spirituality, which was ancient. One of the oldest in the world. Imagine that, how old that culture is. Beautiful, powerful, passionate, proud culture. And well, you know what happened to. I will not re-traumatize myself and those of you here. But I honor my ancestors by honoring the nature that moves through you. And I want to invite you to honor your ancestors by honoring the nature that moves through you. So I wasn't born until 1974 in that island, 482 years after the women lost their power and their body autonomy and the earth wisdom. And so I grew up, I was born and grew up after generations of tremendous, tremendous abuse. And so in my journeys with the medicine, my first psilocybin journey was 500 years of seeing what I had never wanted to see. 
the trauma that lived in me and in my ancestors because of the colonizer's abuse, because of my disconnect from nature. And so my journey has been long and harrowing, but it also brought me to more connection with the earth and the ancestors, which again, I said that I came here looking for healing and I ended up getting so much more. So I thought I would not survive the underworld, but I am here because I did, beloveds. I am here because I survived. I am here because so many people are not able to survive the underworld. Because the underworld is like a rite of passage. It's something that every human goes towards. But this culture not only throws us down there, not only takes the medicines that help us to get out there, not only takes the spiritualities to help us to get out there, I mean, not only take the myths that help us to navigate the underworld, they've taken everything from us. The cold-blooded barbarians. And so I say, how dare you? How dare you take that away from you, from us? How dare you abuse our bodies? I am a defender of the bodies because we think we have body autonomy, but we don't. Let me just say that from the time we are babies, we are taken away from our mothers. Some indigenous cultures say um, that they put babies in cages. Western culture. So imagine how they wrap their babies in their scarves next to them. And for perhaps two years, that nervous system of the baby remembers what it's like to have that other regulated nervous system, that love and support. Then we are five, then we, then we have to go to daycare. Then we're five years old and we want to be climbing trees. We want to be playing. We want to be using the imagination. But no, now we have to sit for how many hours and be perfect still and the energy is moving because we're kids and no, no. And then you have to walk in a perfect straight line like it's effing military. And then 18 years of that. Body wants to, the body, the body wants to stay close to mom. The body wants to sleep. The body wants to play. But no, 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 no. Then 18 years of that, and then you go to college. And then $100,000 later in student loans, you have to have two and three jobs to survive and to continue to support the system and say, how dare you take us away from our mother? Our mother would provide everything from us. This is when I say I come with abundance because I worship the earth mother who is so, so, so abundant in their generosity. I mean, I have a friend here who's a gardener. I wish I could have shown you the abundance of flowers that she gives me, the abundance of herbs the abundance of plants, the abundance of fungi. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. She's that abundant. I believe the only way we are going to survive is by returning to nature. I believe that is the only way forward. The other day, last Saturday, we were doing ceremony, and I'm like, I'm home. I'm home. By home, I mean homeostasis. By home, I mean connected to spirit. By home, I mean, damn, my nervous system is regulated and I feel so good. And I'm like, did anybody make it here without the earth? Did any of the spiritual teachers that came before us made it here? Jesus used to go into the desert and meditate. The Buddha, when he reached enlightenment, this is a great story. Um... The demons kept coming at him. You know, I have demons. We all, right? This is part of the human psyche and getting to know it. There's these parts that torture us. And then the demon said to him, who do you think you are? With which authority? And the Buddha touched the earth and said this. And in that moment, he reached enlightenment. So this is what I'm trying to say, that I don't know if we are going to make it anywhere without the earth, without returning to her wisdom, to her generosity, to her love, to her embrace. The earth is a being floating around space. And each of you is this tiny being here, held down by the mother. This gravitational pull of hers, this force is an effing force. We would all be like, 
you know, floating up. And some of us feel like we're floating up because we're not grounded. I ask each of you to connect to the earth, to anchor yourself and your energy to the earth. We must return to the earth because she will give us everything. First, she will heal us. First, she will make us stronger with these sacred plants and fungi. And then we fight. After, because when you're down there, love, I'm sorry, but when I was down there, there is no more selfish me than when I was down there. I can't give anything. I am like this, right, in freeze. So sustainably do the work of rising up and then we fight for everybody's right to have access to the sacred plants from the mother. I know that some people are passing spores and syringes, and I thank you for that, because we should be sharing all of this. The knowledge, the plan. Thank you. Thank you, loves. As a spiritual teacher of earth-based wisdom... As a spiritual teacher of universal love, I'm here to say to the barbarians, how dare you keep us from the spirit world? How dare you keep us from the magic, from enchantment, from universal love? They are people dying. They are millions, billions of people depressed. I got into this because of human suffering, my own, but... I trained as a minister, as a chaplain, and the kind of suffering that I was seeing is inhumane. We were never meant to suffer in that way by the barbarians took us there. I say to them, how dare you abuse our bodies? How dare you put chemicals in our bodies? Our bodies are temples through which the spirit, the life force, the vitality moves. The moment this vital life force that moves through me is gone, I'm gone. Here, at least. So this vitality, this energy, this life force is powerful and they want it. They want to take it from you, your life force, your energy. Do not let them. Use your energy wisely. Give your energy to causes like this one, to the earth, to those you love. I believe all of this, again, I call the rise of the fallen ones. Let us rise, beloved, like the phoenix. Let us rise. This is what we're doing here. It's been a war on land-based people. It's been a war on our consciousness. Let me explain what I mean. The nervous system ladder here is also connected to our levels of energies. I was always up here like, mm, 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 right? And then I was down there, right? So it's how much energy you have. It's also, the nervous system ladder is connected to the levels of consciousness where uh, panic and fear live down there and this consciousness, like universal consciousness, is more up here. And so in some spirit world is up there. And so in so many ways, this is a war on consciousness and this is a spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. They, when they burned and imprisoned the witches, the herbalists, the plant-based healers, the keepers of this knowledge... It was their way of keeping us from spirit. And I say, how dare you? How dare you? It's like they want us sick and disconnected or something. And let me talk about disconnection for a second because I feel that's one of the many things the sacraments do to us, for us. They give us access to our senses. Psilocybin in particular. My hearing has improved tremendously. Now I'm more connected to, for example, the sounds of the night. The way it's like, I don't know where they end and I begin. So many of us know about the benefits of psilocybin and the visuals that we see, our sense of taste. So it's a multi-sensory experience that takes you out of your mind, that torture chamber, that judges and criticizes and analyzes perfectionism, and so the 
the medicines allow us access to our senses so that we can connect with the, and engage with the environment. So I believe there are two worlds. There's the physical world and there's the energy world or the spiritual world. Just like there is right brain and left brain, creative brain and critical brain. We have been living, we have been wired from the five, time we were five years old. They have been wiring our rational brain, our left brain, with so much information, so much content, so much critical thinking. Because the barbarian from a very young age made sure that we were indoctrinated in that way, for the rational, critical perfectionism that is killing us and our movement. Perfectionism is a serial killer. And it kills movement too. So the opposite is the creative brain, is the spiritual world brain, which is so much about creativity, the imagination, myths, the senses, stories. My brain has been wired by these systems, by the barbarians, but I, when I engage with the medicines, and when we engage with the medicines, we're able to move closer to the other part of the brain. So, which brings me to creativity, in which I close. I, my interest here, I came with it, thinking about healing myself and others, and where I'm at with this is about creating a new world. And let me tell you how we create reality, the way I see it. It's called the reality creation process. So over here we have reality, creation, this day, each of us being here, this moment. We created this moment. We co-created this beautiful space together. This is the result. This is the reality. Before that came an action. Before the action came a decision for you to come, a decision for this to be built. Before the decision came a thought. And sometimes we think that before the thought, there's just consciousness. Consciousness that has a thought, but I say there is something between consciousness and the thought. Who thought that thought? Three years ago, I was down there in hell and I couldn't even make myself come here because I was so afraid of being seen. I did not participate in creating this reality three years ago because I couldn't. So, which part? Which part? There are various parts of you that live in these various parts of the nervous system ladder. Which part are you creating reality with? So what I feel like is like with this work of the rise of the fallen ones, the more we rise, the more we can create with those parts. The more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, like Charles Einstein say, can be created only by rising up. Loves with fear, with racism, with stress, with perfectionism, with this desire to conquer and keep conquering and succeeding. We are not going to build a better world that way. We can create a better world, but the, we need the medicines. We need the sacraments to get us there. Thank you. Thank you. I came into this because of my own suffering. I came into this as a chaplain because I wanted to alleviate human suffering. And I come to believe that we are suffering for many reasons. But one of the main reasons is because we are out of alignment with nature and with our own nature. I believe that ultimately what entheogens do to us is return us to nature, to nature, to the divine and to our own divine nature. This is about the liberation of our nature. This is about the liberation of our life force, of our energies. When we are meek and down here and afraid, we can't do shit. But the more we liberate and free our energy, and this is what these medicines do. It liberates our bodies. It liber oh, somebody was telling me, like, I used to not be able to, to dance anywhere. And all of a sudden, like, I'm dancing. I'm like, yeah, you're getting free. Your body's getting free. So by honoring entheogens, by celebrating entheogens, we honor and celebrate nature, the divine, and our own divine nature. 
And I hope that we get to continue to celebrate afterwards. Join us for the after party to dance, to celebrate, to let the body be free, to embody our joy, which is a birthright. We were not meant to suffer. What kind of God is that? What kind of creator made us to? I mean, like people say, this is earth school. I'm like, I don't think so. I think this is a playground. I think we came here to create I think we came here to have fun and to enjoy and to celebrate. So let us celebrate. Thank you, loves. Wow, everybody. What a culmination. We're not done yet, though. Uh, next up is the Entheo Cup. And before I do that, I want to just throw a special thank you out there right now to Eric and Stacy Vaughn, who were responsible for helping us organize this event today. And then I also want to thank uh, the next person I'm going to bring up, Julie Barron. Julie Barron, I'm sure you all know her name. She started Decriminalized Nature uh, Ann Arbor and Michigan and the Michigan Psychedelic Society. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be on the board with her and a bunch of others that are here today when that decriminalization happened 20, uh, in 2020. Um, she, uh, she's really paramount to this uh, uh, festival and to the movement. So I want to bring her up right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julie Barron. Hi, everybody. Oh, it's so good to be here with you all. Thank you. This is so tall. Um, while Jim thanked me, I, of course, want to uh, honor and thank him. Um, he has done a lot of work in this community over the years with us. And, of course, the, the co-founder and the origin of the idea of EntheoFest right here. So thank you. Right back to you, Jim. So you guys, um, as this movement grows, it's our goal to have safe and responsible use. Um, and so we, we created something um, along with Oakland Hyphae two years ago. We kind of added on to what they were doing, actually. And we did the Michigan Psilocybin Cup. And we really want folks to know that there is testing available for entheogenic substances that you can, you know, we want everyone to know that. And there's testing here in our community. Um, and so this year we're doing the Michigan Entheo Cup you know, as our second year. And um, we just want to make sure you guys know that. If you, if you want to do testing, come up to us afterward and ask us the information one of the things that we've found out, and that I'm sure a lot of you have found out too, is that you can have mushrooms in this hand that might be about two milligrams per gram of psilocybin, and then you can have mushrooms in this hand that are about 30 milligrams per gram of psilocybin, and that's a very big difference, and we want to know what we have in our hand, <laughs> and if we don't, then we just start very low dosing and go really slow, right? But we want, we want to know. And so let's be more in, curious and let's investigate and let's um, just make sure we're being careful. And so this cup is less of a competition and more just a community honoring event and to be able to share that we have some lab testing for good, safe, and responsible use. So I'm hoping that Eric Vaughn will come up. Eric, are you out there? Oh, <laughs> thank you. All right, good. Um, so we're going to announce the winners. You guys, we had 53 entries to the Entheo Cup. Woo! <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Uh, let me just get out my notes because I want to share just a tiny bit about what that is. So 53 submissions. We, we gave three scholarships to folks in the community because it's, it's a little pricey at this point. I'm not going to lie. It'll get cheaper and cheaper the more folks test. So, uh, so we gave a couple scholarships to make it affordable for everybody. Um, we had some really generous donors who donated some money up front to make sure it was going to happen and make sure we have scholarships. So I want to honor those donors too. Um, I want to make a special thanks to Third Eye Optometry Lab. Uh-huh. I want to make a special thanks to Treetown Treasures. Yep, to BDT Smoke Shop. 
and the wonderful team of folks who are about to come up here with me that helped to organize to really like map out what this cup is going to be. So we're going to give uh, winners in lots of different categories, and I invite you all to come up now. Come on up. <laughs> So I'm just going to have um, each person uh, say their name, and then they're going, if they want to, and then they're going to um, read the, the category, and then the specific winner, and then um, the, the public reporting name that we're using to, uh, to identify the winner. And then if you are that winner and you'd like to come up and get your award and get publicly recognized, come on up and grab your award. If you'd rather kind of just be quiet about it, that's okay. And we'll move on to the next person uh, and you can come grab your award afterward or a different time. So, okay, here we go. Winner announcement. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Julie. I'm Eric from Epiphany Mushroom and very honored to announce the winners for the psilocybin microdose competition. We have a tie. First, we have with the strain PE number six, Dr. Mushlove. Is Dr. Mushlove here? Congratulations for the psilocybin microdose winner. And a tie with the strain Malaysian, the winner, the Mycological Connection. Cheers to the Mycological Connection and Dr. Mushlove. If you'd like to come up and gather your awards, great work and congratulations. Hello, hello, I'm Mrs. Vicious, and I'm here to announce the microdose winner uh, of the psilocybin mushroom potency category, Out of This World Genetics, with their strain Phobos. And now for the edibles category, the closest predicted dose winner is Dragon Ball Z. Now for the psilocybin edible submission, the accurate dose winner, it is Detroit Fungi with their chocolate bar. Hi everybody, my name is Jess Oldham and I'm one of your testing facilitators for the Entheo Cup. And it is my pleasure to announce the winner of one of the biggest mushroom contests. For biggest mushroom category by weight, the Chonk Award goes to T3 Edibles for their albino monkey dick strain coming in at 39.4 grams dry weight. Congratulations. <laughs> that is a mushroom. All right. Uh, the next winner of the biggest mushroom competition, um, biggest mushroom for height, okay? The mycological connection with their extraterrestrial fourth kind at 29 centimeters in length. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, y'all, we're going to keep going. This one's the psilocybin mushroom potency category. And this is the re recreational winner. And it is T3 Edibles for their Kiko Crash Strain. The psilocybin content was 10.1 milligrams per gram. In the biggest mushroom category, the cap with winner is also T3 Edibles. The cap with was 13.8 centimeters, and the strain was Shakti. <laughs> um, in the psilocybin mushroom potency category, the therapeutic dose winner is also T3 Edibles. The strain is Yeti, and the psilocybin content was 15 milligrams per gram. <laughs> Can 
congratulations. Okay. This is our last one. Um, this is the psilocybin mushroom potency category. This is our very most potent mushroom that was tested. And I want to say that we have different kinds of mushrooms, right? The psilocybin cubensis are not as potent as the pan cyan. And so this one is specifically a pan cyan strain. So we do expect that to be you know, boards above uh, the, the others. Um, but this is the spiritual winner, and it is Altered Vibes. <laughs> and the, listen to this, you guys. It is the psilocybin content is 29.9 milligrams per gram. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> So um, that is the Michigan Entheo Cup for 2023. We'll bring it back again. Uh, celebrate those winners and keep growing, you guys. Keep growing. Up next is Shelly Smith. She's going to do the book drawing that you guys have all been filling out drawing tickets for. So here she is from Reeds and Weeds. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hi. I'm so excited to give books away right now. It's going to be so fun. Hooray. Okay. The first person is going to win Invisible Landscape by Terrence and Dennis McKenna. And that person is Soul R. Is Soul R here? We will call that person. <laughs> All right, the next person, next winner, is going home with Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. And that person is... David McKinnis. David McKinnis, are you here? You can come up. Or is David... Ma oh, is that you? Oh, my gosh. I love it. Oh, I'm so happy you won. Um, okay, and the next person is taking home uh, The Teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda, and that is Greg... Strine. Greg Strine. Are you here? Are you in the area? Oh my gosh, yay, Greg! Oh, I'm so glad. It's here. Hi. We did the Hash Bash treasure hunt together, Josie. Remember that crew? All right. The next person is taking home Pical, a chemical love story. And that is Nick Holius. I hope I'm saying this right. Am I saying it right? Nick, do you know who that is? Am I saying it wrong? Let me see. I feel like someone's making fun of me. Could I, I could just be a little stoned. Colcus, we will find you. You are taking home Pical. And then the next person is taking home Plants, People, and Culture, uh, The Science of Ethnobotany. This is beautiful. And that person is, I could not read a word on that ticket, sorry, is Sabrina Wolf. Is Sabrina Wolf here? We will find you. There's one more ticket to be drawn, and this person gets all of those books that we just mentioned. They get a whole library. Yes, yes. Sarah's doing the drawing. I'm going to do it. Reads and weeds, baby. Okay, Jason Harris. Jason Harris, is that you? Oh my gosh, Jason gets the whole library. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you come to the after party, and it was wonderful spending time with you all today. Um, I don't know if that's the end. <laughs> Hang around. Thank you so much for coming uh, to Indio Fest. Woo! Thank you so much. So happy we got some good books out there. Hey, if you entered the cup and you did not get an award, even if you did get an award, we're going to po post the results publicly on the EntheoFest page and the Michigan Psychedelic Society page, and we're going to send everybody um, reports about their testing. So we'll get those out sometime in the next week, the first chance that we get. 
We next have the Tamarian Institute, and they're going to do a entheogen informed martial arts demonstration with you guys. It's going to be lovely. I'm hoping that they'll come over now, but I'm going to take the opportunity. Yeah, let's have folks that are in the front just move back maybe five or six feet because they're going to come up and be right in this space here. You guys, this event, while it was hosted um, and, and majorly organized by my, myself, Jim Salaim and Emma Mead, this was an entire community collaboration to make this event happen. And I just want to honor all of you guys that are part of this community. We are because of you, right? We are because of each other. So a real true heartfelt thank you to you guys. We were going to do a t-shirt giveaway. I think we might end up doing that at the after party. Do you guys know about the after party? The after party is free. Everybody is welcome. It's at the rabbit hole at Root. It's on First Street. It's next to the Blind Pig. We're going to do a little parade over there pretty soon. Um, it, it opens doors at 5, and I think it gets going closer to 6. We hope you all will join us over there. And I see they're starting to make this way. So Kalindi E is a, a, a legend at this point. Um, he was a local community member. He was a local psychedelic leader, maybe I want to say the original psychedelic leader uh, that I'm aware of um, in, in the area, the Detroit area and around. And he started the Tamarian Institute. And we are so very honored to continue his work here, have his family members here, and his students, and the Tamarian Institute. So get ready for some good entheogen martial arts. Thank you, guys. All right, uh, family, it's a special treat for me uh, to represent my family and uh, the legacy in which I come from. Uh, Tamaria Institute was founded on several principles. Uh, primarily, it was a martial system, but it was developed and it was maintained from a very ancient system. So those of us that are familiar with the Temple of Abu Sar and Kemet, you'll find those fighting techniques and styles etched on the walls. So this is a maintenance of that tradition. So these traditions are not something that was concocted off of five grams. These are some things that were, <laughs> that have existed for thousands of years. And to the extent that uh, we've been honored to maintain this tradition, um, I've been honored to uh, be a part of this community and this tradition. Um, I've been honored to be a part of the family. And so um, I've just taken a little time to give you an introduction because while my brothers get prepared. Um, Ahasaki is a combative science. So what we're going to show you, of course, is our creative, cultural, artistic expression of a very uh, serious science. Um, unlike a lot of contemporary martial arts, it is combative. And in our system, martial arts deal with all aspects of life. So it doesn't just deal with the physical. It also deals with the spiritual, which is how I was introduced to the sacred plant realm. As I was told, once you get over the idea that you are not perfect, you have to embrace the idea of your own first internal spirit, but your physical morality. And so I was challenged by Kalindi many years ago, like all of us, to go into the unknown. So uh, it's an honor to present this. We will be getting started shortly. This is my elder. Uh, Baba Amewa, who will be starting us off. So let's tune in. Uh, if you have any questions or comments afterwards, we would love to engage you. But thank you very much for your audience. Trust me, it's worth the wait. Trust me. 
So you guys, we have a t-shirt giveaway we're going to do. SAPS, the Student Association for Psychedelic Studies here at U of M, is going to do a t-shirt giveaway. And you guys have been filling out some, some drawing tickets. So Emma Mead, once again. Yes, so we're going to choose five lucky winners from this very official looking plastic bag. Um, and if you are drawn, please make your way to the SAPS booth and you get to choose what color and size shirt you would like. Okay, so the winners are Cody Benjamin Carey. Cody? All right. Um, Megan Stoles. Congratulations. Make your way over to the SAPS table. Megan Stoles. And if these people aren't here, we will give them a call. Next is Christy Jones. Is there a Christy Jones here? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Owen Fader. Owen Fader. Come on. Last winner is Diana Flores. Anyone? Any woos? Yeah, nice. All right. Over here, we can get you your t-shirts. Thank you. Since I have a moment, I'm going to share with you all a little bit more about the Entheo Cup and how we chose the winners. I actually had prepared to do this before, and then you know what happens when you get on the mic in front of people. So um, how did we pick the winners? The microdose judging category, we had a panel of five judges, which is such a lovely thing to do to, to be able to test microdoses. So they got to test them out for a week and then report one to 10 in different um, areas. It was energy, mood, and intensity, one to 10 rated. So that was one category. Another category that we had was mushroom potency, because again, like I said before, the mushroom potency can vary quite a bit. So we had four winners in that category. We had microdose, we had recreational dose, we had spiritual dose, and we had, or sorry, therapeutic, and then spiritual. The microdose winner was the, the submission that had closest to five milligrams per gram of psilocybin, and then some psilocin. I'm not sure if all of you guys are aware, I know a lot of you are, our body doesn't process psilocybin, our body doesn't use psilocybin, it actually uses psilocin. So if you take psilocybin, your body breaks it down into psilocin, and then that psilocin is usable. So it's highly unstable. <laughs> so it's the only category we looked at psilocin, and if you have psilocin in your mushrooms, it's likely to have a little faster onset than psilocybin might, because psilocybin has to get broken down. So then we have the rec winner, the recreational winner, which was the selected based on the closest test result to 10 milligrams per gram of psilocybin. The therapeutic dose winner was selected based on the, the sample that was the closest to 15 milligrams per gram of psilocybin. The spiritual winner was based on the highest potency content of psilocybin. So that's how we chose those winners. The edible winners were based on lab testing, um, based on how accurately they predicted the dose and how, how able they were to maintain psilocybin content from beginning to end product. So, yeah, that's how we decided the winners. And I know that these guys are getting pretty close to being ready. Are you ready? Okay, we will delay no further. Welcome the Tamarian Institute. <laughs> Thank you. 
You've seen it, folks, the 2023 Antio Fest from Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Okay, folks, you've seen it, Antio Fest 2023 from Ann Arbor, Michigan, right here. I'm standing right here with my niece and my nephew, Steve and Emily. They're from Arizona, baby. And they're at Antio Fest 2023 right here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. You're watching Global World TV. And my name is The Raven, baby. <laughs> Love you guys. Love you guys. Okay, we're done. We're out. That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>